It was the night before my project was due, and I was stressing out. I knew I would have to work all night in order to meet my deadline. When all of a sudden, one of my first clients walks in. No knock, no appointment. Frustrated, I get up to see what she needed. After all, I do need clients. And uh, as we began reviewing the thick binder of legal documents that she had in her hand, I started getting lost in translation. With the legal jargon and the language barriers, we were truly struggling. After all, I was only 13 years old, and my first client was my sweet mom. <laughs> Love you, mom. Children often take the roles of interpreters at schools, hospitals, and even with in engaging with social services. But let's be honest, the training required for an interpreter takes years to learn the best practices and ethical implications of translation and interpretation. The risk in using a child as an interpreter is that, well, they may misinterpret it innocently at best, or, well, maybe not so innocently at worst. Take, for example, a child who arrives home so excited to show his parents his report card that he received an F for fantastic. <laughs> as opposed to failing. For obvious reasons, children should not be used to translate, so there must be a systemic solution. And this is where language access comes in. Language access is an organizational practice aimed at providing fair and equitable services for multilingual learners. Language access will require an institution to review its organizational barriers and determine what exactly it is that prevents a multilingual learner from actively using, engaging, and participating, or otherwise contributing to a public service or a program. Now, let me be clear. New Americans are highly motivated to learn English, but learning a new language is tough. Just try recalling your high school Spanish or French class. It's hard. And as part of this learning experience, it'll take a journey for someone to learn English. Sometimes it takes years, and it gets harder as we get older. For example, children under the age of 13, they are able to absorb language much easier than adults. Children under the age of 13 have developing brains, and it will absorb new vocabulary into everyday use. But as we get older, it gets much more difficult. It gets much more difficult to shake your native language accent and develop a perfect American accent. And on their journey to mastering a new language, it is important that we, as a community, meet them where they are. Because for some multilingual speakers, language access can be a matter of life and death. As an immigration attorney, I have seen firsthand how something as simple as an interpretation hotline can change a life. A few years ago, I met a woman who had suffered a panic attack at a Target. 911 was called, and when the ambulance and the police arrived, she was rushed to the hospital. Her boyfriend was right by her side and tightly holding her hand and never leaving her alone. When they arrived at the hospital and she was sedated, the police began asking questions about what happened. Well, they quickly realized she only spoke Spanish, so they promptly recruited her boyfriend to start translating. No, officer, nothing's wrong. No, officer, she's fine. We just need to go home. Officer, let us go home. The woman was, in fact, not OK. Because at that moment, a bilingual nurse walked in and overheard her say something completely different in Spanish. She said, I've called the police on my boyfriend before because he's violent with me. I've tried leaving him and ending this relationship, but he keeps stalking me. I panicked when I saw him at the store. This woman was lucky, because without the bilingual nurse who was at the right place at the right time, officers wouldn't have been able to do their jobs, and this woman may have been sent home sedated with her abuser. Now, language access can be a lifeline. And the Constitution recognizes the importance of language access. The Equal Protection Clause provides that the government cannot discriminate based on race, color, or national origin. And Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 further provides that any institution, public or private, must provide reasonable accommodations towards meaningful language access. Now, does this mean that every institution has to provide every single person a personal interpreter? Well, no. In fact, the Department of Justice built a four-factor test, which is flexible. This four-factor test takes a look at 
Number one, the number of multilingual learners in a given population. Number two, the frequency in which they come into contact for those services. Three, the nature of the services and how important they are. And four, the cost of providing language access. This fact-dependent and flexible standard is used to determine what the minimum threshold is for any organization's language access plan. So, for example, a law enforcement agency in New York City will have a much more different language access plan than, say, a food pantry in Charleston, South Carolina. While the food pantry's language access plan may include a volunteer interpreter or perhaps the use of Google Translate, the law enforcement agency in New York City will at the very minimum require an interpretation hotline, the recruitment of bilingual officers, and distribution of vital information in multiple languages. Now, language access isn't just about inclusivity. It's a strict necessity for businesses to continue competing in the global marketplace. Language access isn't just about being fair. It's about staying competitive and thriving in a globalized economy. Language access can, in fact, be a gateway for economic growth. So let me ask the audience a question. What do you think is the most spoken language in the world? So some of you may think English just like I did, but in fact, only 18% of the global population speaks English. Let me ask you another question. Do countries have official languages? Well, some countries do have official languages. South Africa has 11 languages declared in its constitution. Spain has four, and Switzerland has four, including Italian, French, German, and Romanoche, spoken by less than 1% of the population. And here, in the United States, we don't have an official language. It's not in our federal law, it's not in our federal policy, and it's not in our constitution. And I suspect that it has something to do with the fact that our founding fathers and other colonists brought with them their native languages of Dutch, German, and French. Not to mention the many Native Americans who already spoke indigenous languages here. Now, in 2007, my home country of Bolivia experienced what it was like to change language access policy in real time. In 2007, the Bolivian Constitution was amended to add two indigenous languages, Quechua and Aymara. And over the next few years, the transformation was incredible. Government workers were required to learn a whole new language. Schools began teaching Quechua and Aymara to prepare the future workforce. And new businesses began seeing the positive economic benefits of serving a whole new population. I remember the last time that I watched the Bolivian news, there were co-hosts speaking in Spanish, Quechua, and Aymara, and on the bottom right-hand corner, an ASL interpreter for the deaf community. This is language access in Bolivia. This is creating bridges across language barriers. Now, for some, language access can be a lifeline for those people who are seeking those services, but it's also essential for the service providers who work so hard to provide us with effective services in our communities, like hospitals and doctors. I can still relate to that today. Several years ago, my dad was rushed to the hospital. It was a dark day, it was cold, it was wet outside, and the way that the outside felt mirrored what my insides felt like. And I looked across the room at my mom, my dad, and my sister, and their faces said it all. They were terrified as we waited on news about my dad's medical diagnosis. And at that moment when the doctor walked in, she looked at us and said, do you speak English? I said, yes, of course we do. We've been here for decades, but I'll help translate if we need it. Your dad has leukemia, she said. Leukemia. I had never used the word in Spanish. So? I did what I could and I translated it in English. Papi, dicen que tienes leukemia. Your dad's gonna need chemotherapy, she said. Chemotherapy, another word I had never used in my life. Papi, dicen que vas a necesitar chemotherapy. Your dad's also gonna need a bone marrow transplant. I have never had a conversation about transplants in Spanish. At that moment, I had to swallow the pain that I felt as my father's daughter and become a trained medical interpreter at that time. Papi, dicen que vas a necesitar un bone marrow transplant. At that moment, I began wondering 
What is it that families without bilingual daughters do to access the health care that they need? How do the doctors get appropriate medical diagnosis without the interpreters? Today, we stand at a crossroads with language access. And I invite all of you to join me as advocates for language access. There are several things that we can do. Number one, let's engage in conversations in our community. Talk about the barriers and understand what the multilingual neighbors are going through. Let's listen to them and co-create solutions together. Two, let's invest in language learning, whether it's enrolling our children in a language program, downloading an app ourselves to learn a new language, or investing in ESL programs for multilingual learners. Let's break down those barriers that separate us. And number three, let's hold our institutions accountable. Take a look at where you work, where you live, the organizations you're affiliated with. Do they have a language access plan? Remember, language access isn't just a privilege. It is a civil right. And I believe that together, we can advocate for this community and build bridges across language barriers. Thank you.